Right, I'm, my name is, are you ready? My name is the Reverend E. Pitts. I'm, well, Reverend Canon E. Pitts, if I really want to be pompous, you know. Um, and I've been vicar here for 10 years just over. And um, it's a good place, Birchfield. It has its ups and downs, um, as you expect, in a so-called inner city parish. Uh, there's not an awful lot of wealth, um, monetary wealth around. But what we lack in monetary wealth, we have in other ways, in good ways. And I think one of the things that irritates me about what people say to me when I say I'm in an inner city parish, they always think, oh, it must be really hard for you. Of course it is. But it's hard in a middle class parish. It has just different problems. Yeah. Um, but it's a joy to be here. And it's a joy. It's the first time I've been in a parish with a predominantly black African Caribbean community. Right. And, and that's, there's a lot to be said for that as well. Yeah. And did you always know that you would follow a path serving God? Yeah, I was a precocious child. Um, my mother always used to say, you're going to go to Hollywood one day, aren't you? And um, yeah, and I almost did because my first church, uh, my second church was in Hollywood. So, <laughs> so they, were, they, were, they were nearly there, they were nearly there. And yes, I really, I wanted to be um, an actress or a soprano. But um, God had other ideas and pursued me. And I resisted for a long time because um, I find God difficult. I'm just not one of these people who uh, find faith relaxing and um, unchallenging. Mm. I find faith extremely difficult as a black woman, um, as a woman, but as a black woman primarily. I have great struggles with God in terms of my history the history of my people. Um, if you think of the last 400 years of our history, it has at times tried my faith. And the more I learn about my faith, my faith and my history, the more I realize um, how much we've coped with and continue to cope with. Well, uh, so I, I, you know. We'll talk more about that in detail, but I just want to ask about the fact that you were the first black yeah, Caribbean, female from vicar Caribbean, yes. in, to be ordained. Yes. What was that like at the time? I felt a bit like a trophy, actually. It was a bit like a trophyization of an individual. Look, we've got one, you know. So there was a sense in which um, it was an exciting time, but full of trepidation and, you know, um, am I going to function within this all-white institution um, with its institutional problems? Mm. So even at that time, you know, one of the things I was really interested in as, a, as one of the first black women uh, or black human being to be in the Church of England uh, in recent history, because our history is littered with all kinds of nonsense. Um, I felt a real sense that um, I had to resist any attempt for me to see God through other people's spectacles. Mm. So I, and I'm still resisting that, whether it's through an all male spectacle or uh, uh, an all white spectacle. So, and these issues were alive then and they are now. Yes. You know, it's the sort of how do I, as a black woman, remain um, true to who I am with a profound understanding of who I am. This is not a newly discovered Eve. I've always been this way. I am you know, totally committed to my culture and all that that entails. That means it's not easy. Well, yeah. let's talk about that culture because, as you say, um, especially the recent history, the 400 years, one of the main stories that we're hearing more and more about, obviously, is the slave trade. And oh, you're I know. Very it annoys me. And highlighting that. Y yes, because you see, society as a whole want to tell black people that's all we ever were and all we'll ever be. We'll ever be. And it's a nonsense, it's a lie, and they know it's a lie. And for those of us who do not know our history, do not know the thousands of years before that, you know, before the enslavement. We weren't born slaves. And I really need to emphasize that the enslavement of my people uh, by um, others who had, had sort of destroyed the history of our people. And, and a lot of it is still there. But, but you know, the 400 years is a blip, limp, just a, just a small part of the wonderful legacy of black history, you know. Uh, we forget that um, humanity wouldn't be what it is today without writing and mathematics, which did not come from Europe. 
and, um, and you know, the whole concept of God. The concept of God has always been in Africa. And African people are very spiritual people. The invention of uh, lots of things would not have happened. The first university in the world was Timbuktu, an African university, you know. Uh, they were doing medicine in ancient Egypt long before the West. You know, so I, I just get tired of the, the sort of negative narrative. And um, those yeah. who don't know the history can be bullied to believe that. Yeah. But for those of us who know, we just keep beating the drum, literally and metaphorically, yes. to say, this is not true. This is only, you will make this true if you begin to believe it. And if you believe it, because what, one of the things that does, it crushes the spirit of black people. And, um, and once you begin to crush a people and tell them that they're of no value, and that unless they look like particular groups of people, they're of no value, then you've destroyed them. And I'm sorry to say that, um, you know, we have this sort of a tyranny of colorism, and of color. It's a tyranny which has all but destroyed the minds of many of my people. And I, I lament, I'm, I'm really saddened by that. And when you teach a people to despise themselves, you can say what you like about them. Well, you show that, the, um, you highlight the issue of slavery because you change yourself um, and you walked outside the church, didn't you? Why did you, I, what did you actually do and exp explain? I mean, I, it was a very humbling experience. Uh, and I do it every year, by the way. And I do it every 1st of August. You know, I stand outside and I, and I get looked at and think, oh, that poor thing, you know. Um, you know, she was a former slave. And, and, and I get, even from my own people, there's a sort of shame. And, it, and I often say, this is not our shame. Come on, this is not my shame. And we're sort of stuck in that sort of 400 years. But I do it because I think, for me, just to be here, I just have to remind myself, and I think all of us have to remind ourselves as, as people, that who we are from whence we came. You know, how did they get over? There's that wonderful um, American spiritual, you know, how they got over. And, and so I pause once a year, remind myself, and I know it's like walking from in here, this church, to outside um, with chains around me. And believe me, that's hard enough just to do it. And there's a real sense of, um, yes, I can never fully understand how my ancestors must have felt, but I get a glimpse of that. And I will do it even if people look at me as if they think I'm slightly batty. Well, you know, it takes batty people to change the world. <laughs> and I am going to do what I can to change however batty they may think I am. I am not going to leave this world until I make an impact. Wait, even if it's just this corner of my world, I will do something and I will educate my people. And it will be risky because it's always risky. Whenever you challenge, it's risky. Yes. And I'm not afraid. You want to make August the 1st a National Remembrance Day, I don't want you? August the 1st and to combine it with a day of remembering their ancestors. And um, August the 1st, I mean, because you see, dates are important. They give us signals into our past and our future. So um, nothing happens except that for me on the 1st. And I have written to my own bishop, and I've written to the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, recently um, to make the 1st of August a day of remembrance to... Because I say to people, black and white, Asians, it, we're all tied up in this. History doesn't belong to one group of people. And we can use history in any way, we, which way we like. We can use history and tell ourselves stories about ourselves. We can tell ourselves untruths about ourselves. We can glamorize our past, or we can uh, sort of damage the past of others. And for me, as I said to many people, my history is your history. We are more tied up than we want to admit. So when the Church of England, which is where I am and have been for the past 30 years or more, when we realize that we are bound together, we are chained together whether we like it or not. Yes. And if you dehumanize one group of people, you dehumanize yourself. And until our society wake up to that fact, you cannot dehumanize another person without dehumanizing yourself. T very, very true. Um, on a happier note, yeah. <laughs> and, and the work you've done here in the church, especially when it comes to fundraising, tell oh. us about 
the roof in particular? Oh, the roof. Oh, when I came here 10 years ago, I was told that it should have been done 14 years prior to my arrival. And I thought, okay, here we go again. I've done it at one church, here we go again. We had to raise money, of course, and got a group of people together to make sure that we had the money, because we didn't have any money at all. I mean, we've worked a minor miracle here. Yeah. We've been able to get money from HLF, you know, the Heritage Lottery Fund, and that's been amazing, and that's been done. But then we had to do inside because the ceiling needed work. The sacristy was dangerous. They said if it rained and we caught fire, then we wouldn't get any insurance money. And so we then thought, oh, help, and the floor had to be done two or three years ago. And then the lighting was poor. It was virtually dark in here. And then we had to find money for that. And God help us, we did. They've been amazing. I don't know how this group of people have done it. I've partly bullied them, loved them, <laughs> sort of, and laughed with them, cried with them, prayed with them. And you've and done we've some done it. amazing things yourself, haven't you? Tell, tell me about this all night disco dancing and oh, well, sleeping on the roof. What well, we that was my last church. This is my last church oh, okay. where I rebuilt it because there was no money. Again, this is the second time. It's becoming a habit, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, my last church, they had no money and I raised, I think, 350,000. Um, and we didn't get HLF money there. That was just me sleeping on the roof, sleeping under the roof, sleeping outside the road, walking to Canterbury, uh, walk from on my own to Canterbury. Um, yes, and I didn't do anything like that here because the roof is just too high. But what I have done is encourage the people of God. This is your church. You've been here since the 50s. This is a place that you, where you, wherein you've cried, you've baptized your babies, you've buried your dead. This is a testimony of a journey of a group of people from the Caribbean, all across the Caribbean, who worshipped in this place. So now I've got it in good shape. Yeah. Um, and it and looks great. It's, it's great. It's absolutely great. And then, then if that wasn't enough, just as we moved back in after a year, the, the boiler broke down. And we thought, oh, help. And, and then we collected again. And, and we've done it. We've and done it. I really to. give God thanks for that. And then we do lots of crazy things here. I have the ancestor service every year. Every year, the third Sunday in um, September, the 20th of September this year, we have a service of remembrance. And we get a good crowd. It's full. Sometimes it's packed. Uh, and why do I need it? It's called Arise and Honor Your Ancestors. I do it because I'm absolutely committed to my history. I'm absolutely committed to the people from whence I've sprung. Mm. I'm absolutely committed that we do not forget. And you know, I have tremendous respect for those people who said we will not forget. Because I think the world is in such a state now. For me and my people, the people from whom I sprung, it's a dangerous thing to forget. Absolutely. And um, so every year I have the service. So the 1st of August, we, I stand outside looking all forlorn but on the, in September, I have a service to remember, arise and honor my ancestors, the people without whom I would not be here, Sam, the people who've helped to create me, the creative, gorgeous people that we are. More often than not, we do not realize how very special we are to God. Yes. And society has managed somehow to persuade many of us to believing that God couldn't possibly be like us. Yeah. The only God I believe in is God. It's a God who understands me, the God who takes me seriously, and the God who looks like me. Yes, yes, and that, that's it, isn't it? That yeah. you are reflected yes. in, in what you believe. I mean, that's one of my struggles with the Church of England, or with any Christianity, with any faith. Any faith that tells you yes. that you have to look through other people's spectacles for God to take you seriously is dangerous. Yes. Dangerous to your soul. I think you're a great role model for women as well. Um, not only black women, but all women. And I, I think that is something perhaps... I love women. And um, I, as you know, as I've started writing poetry again and, and taking poetry seriously, because I used to write a lot in Radio, uh, Radio, from Radio Nottingham when I was a, a, a bit of a whippersnapper, you know, sort of <laughs> young woman. And I started writing seriously again and my love of women, uh, and the reason I, f I focus on black women, of course, uh, and the, the one I wrote this morning, I, I wrote for women generally, but one verse was about the woolen hair queens of, of the world. Um, but in a world in which women are under attack, you know, yet again, it's sort of patriarchy, 
um, have done terrible damage, you know, the whole sort of Me Too movement. Um, and this is not about, I'm not into burning bra and, and all that stuff, but I am into um, feeling valued by God's um, creative action in the world. And so I think we have to protect girls and we have to give women confidence to be ourselves, uh, confidence to believe in a God who takes us seriously. Um, I mean, I, I love Jesus. I love this whole story of Jesus. You know, Jesus hung around with women, strong women like Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdala, and Veronica and all of those women. So yeah, I think women have much to say to the, to the world. And I think for black people, it's black women who are going to do it. Black women, I'm not degrading our men, but I'm just saying, there's something about womanhood which gives me great hope for the future. And I think the Me Too movement, the um, you know, time, climate change and our young people, uh, this is a great time despite, you know, in the context of history, there's always, always going to be times when you think, oh, it's coming to an end, the world is coming to an end. But actually, it isn't. And um, it's time for women to actually stand tall and stand with, e with each other. Yes. Because unless we do, then I'm afraid it doesn't look good. You do involve everybody, though, don't you, in the service? I know I came to a wedding service here. You involve the children. Um, Absolutely. You involve men. You involve women. It, it's very much a holistic in mm. experience, mm. Isn't it? I think for a long time, you know, I mean, children, I give children respect. If a child is crying, you do not take the child out. You keep the child here. You know, you become like a child. I love that story of Jesus, you know, when he says, unless you become like one of them you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So I, I make time, I make sure the policy here, the public policy, is that no matter what the child is doing, to do it with respect yes. to the child. Do not diminish the child. And I think adults on the whole are very good at diminishing children without even realizing it. So it's a, an inclusive service, and a service even if I'm preaching on, on a normal Sunday, today's first Sunday. First Sunday we have an open mic, and it's pretty risky, but uh, <laughs> I take the risk because I said, you know, what do you want to talk about this week? Um, people, there's always um, a, co a conversation, a, dis a debate about the journey that they've had the past week. Yes. Um, and as you've seen this morning, it's about current affairs, it's about the virus, and you know, it's about anxiety about what happens if you know it's near in, in our midst. How do we respond to that? Yeah, and I think, for me, that's what the kingdom of God looks like. Yes. And if, 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 and that's my problem with, you know, the sort of language of inclusive, inclusivity. Um, if the language of the church is simply about men, I have a problem with that. If it's just about women, I have a problem with that. So I include, because for me, that's what the community of Christ should be about. Yes. And if the community of Christ is about um, patriarchy, or sort of just women matriarchal, then, that's equally disturbing. The, for me, the kingdom of God is about men and women, black and white. We're not there yet because we're still encountering racism. And if I were to sit here and tell you that racism isn't a problem, I'd be lying. Mm. But I'm hoping that there are going to be men and women who can work towards a time when whether we are from Pakistan, India, Caribbean, you know, the great Nanny of the Maroons, Harriet Tubman, all those great women of color can work together with those who want to work with us yes. to make a difference. Because I think if that doesn't happen, then it's not going to be good for humanity. How do you unwind, Reverend? How do you unwind? I love music. Apart from writing poetry, I love music. So I have a lot of reggae music, Peter Tosh, Bob Marley, Rolling, you know, sort of Burning Spare, you know, um, all of those really substantial reggae music that teaches me something about myself. And I love, I, I love classical music, I love soprano because I wanted to be a classical singer. So I listen to a lot of, uh, you know, Jesse Norman, and I go to the theater. Um, once a month I just get dressed and go to the theater. Yeah. Without anyone, I don't want anyone with me. I just sit down and watch a good play. And enjoy it. And, and enjoy it. So, you yeah. still sing beautifully. My voice is not as good as it used to be. I used to be a soprano, and, and now, because I haven't looked after her very well, um, she's deserting me, but I have a good speaking voice, and I like that. I like my voice, actually. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. and it, it's certainly very powerful. I just have one final question mm. for you, Reverend Eve, and, mm. if that, and that is, if there was a single prayer of yours that could be answered by God for all of humanity, 
what would it be? To get rid of the demon demonic forces of racism. That's what I fight about, dream about, sing about, cry about. Um, I refuse to believe in a God who doesn't care that my race is diminished. Great. Yeah. Reverend Eve, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Lovely.